copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 128. All cars assist the Bunko Squad in cleaning up a gang of swindlers operating as bookmakers. That's all. Those who Tonight's case tells of the activities of the Los Angeles Police Department. And it certainly is an active department, with nearly a thousand police cars, ambulances, motorcycles, and other motorized emergency equipment in almost continuous use. All of these engines operate on Rio Grande cracked gasoline exclusively. Add to this huge fleet the number of emergency cars operated by Oakland, Berkeley, Maricopa County, Arizona, and the many other cities and counties using Rio Grande cracks, and you easily see that many millions of gallons of this gasoline are used in government and law enforcement work. Naturally, purchases of this huge quantity are made as a result of careful tests of all available brands of gasoline. And it is convincing proof of the superiority of Rio Grande cracked gasoline that these many contracts are awarded year after year to this company. Rio Grande proudly points to the undeniable fact that more police and emergency cars are powered with Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand as proof that you cannot buy a finer or more efficient gasoline for your car than Rio Grande cracked. The gasoline that gives you police car performance. And now it is our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Two weeks ago tonight, on this program, I urged the adoption of universal fingerprinting, not only as an aid to law enforcement agencies, but also as a protection to the law-abiding citizen. Aided by a cooperative city council, we are making unique strides in Los Angeles toward deterring crime and protecting the citizens. What is probably the only municipal legislation of its kind in the world goes into effect next Thursday, May 14, when the new ordinance requiring the registration of ex-convicts goes into effect. Thereafter, any person with a criminal record will be guilty of a misdemeanor if they have not registered with the police department. This ordinance is not to be mistaken as placing a stigma upon the individual who, having broken the law in the past, and paid his debt to society, wishes to remain in peace. The police department has no intention of annoying these people, nor of making public the information they obtain. But this required registration of former criminals will discourage the underworld from immigrating into Los Angeles from other points, will prove a crime deterrent to those who might possibly be planning future evil, and will be an immeasurable protection to the law-abiding group of the citizenry. If such a system had been in force at the time the case you were here tonight occurred, several unfortunate victims would not have lost their life savings to a group of shrewd crooks. Our story tonight goes back 24 years to the early part of 1913. In the Fifth Street Depot in Los Angeles, Benjamin Fowler, visiting farmer of Rascuda, Illinois, stands absorbed in the timetable to the beat when he feels a tap on his back. Turning, he finds a total stranger facing him. I hope you'll forgive me for taking the liberty of speaking. I noticed you're wearing an odd fellow's button. Seeing as how I'm an odd fellow, too, I, I thought I'd introduce myself. Why, sure. Of course. I, I'm glad you did. Well, he gets money alone from here in the city, not knowing anyone. So when I noticed your button, I thought I felt like I'd run into an old friend. Well, I, I, I might say the same thing. I'm a stranger here in town, too. Fowler is the name. Ben Fowler. Fowler? Well, mine's Harold Reed. Glad to know you, Mr. Reed. But you don't seem to know the hand clap. Ah, it's been so long since I went to the lodge that I thought I got out of the habit. You know how it is. Oh, sure. 
I was kind of surprised for a minute, though. Where are you from, Fowler? Muscute, Illinois. Muscute, eh? You got a farm back there? Uh, a small one. Are you out here for a visit, or are you thinking on staying? Well, I'm not just certain. I've been sort of halfway thinking about bringing the missus out here and settling down, but I don't know. Great little place, L.A. I wouldn't live anywhere else now that I've found the way to live. You know the place pretty well? Pretty well. Say, hey, uh, I was just on my way down to Venice to have a little fun. Maybe you'd like to join me. Why, I was thinking of going to Venice myself. I'd be glad they have the company. You got anything particular to do when you get there? No. Well, I'd sort of browse around and see the sight. Well, how'd you like to take a little flyer on a sure thing? A flyer? How do you mean? Make a little bet on the ponies. Double your money. No, I don't guess I'd want to do that. I don't know anything about horse racing. I wouldn't have any idea how to bet. You don't have to if you really want to get in on something hot. I'm not depending on luck to win for me. I got a sure thing. You mean a tip? Better than that. Tips can go wrong. This can't. Well, maybe you're not interested. Well, of course. If, if it's a sure thing, uh, that is, if you think I can play and not lose too much, uh, I guess it would be sort of fun. <laughs> of course it's fun. I don't suppose you'd be sore if you happened to win a bet, would you? <laughs> can't say that I would. Well, in that case, there's nothing holding us. Let's go. Boarding a beach-bound electric car, farmer Ben Fowler listens with avid interest as his newfound friend explains how his system always works, why he can be sure of winning. Looks forward to an afternoon of profit. Arriving at Venice, Reed leads the way to a small saloon, pilots his companion up a flight of stairs into a small, smoke-filled room, introduces him. Eddie, uh, this is Mr. Fowler. He's an old friend of mine from Illinois. Oh, pleased to meet you, Mr. Fowler. How do you do? Uh, would you like to see how they run things here, Fowler? Why, yes, I would. Well, uh, here's the phone. Uh, these are connected directly to the various tracks where the races are run. Say, there's a lot of them, aren't there? There has to be in order that we... Or rather, the fellows who operate this place can keep track of the times and the placing of the various races. You're going to take a little flyer this afternoon, Mr. Orange? You bet. You don't think I'd, I'd miss a sure thing like that, do you? I wouldn't think so. How about you, Mr. Fowler? Well, I, <coughs> I can't see where it'd do any harm to make a little bit. It's not too big, of course. Any old amount. It's up to you. The more you play, the more you win. Well, uh, uh, are there races going on now? Sure thing. Coming up in about five minutes. You can put me down for $40, Eddie. Right. How about you, Fowler? Well, I, I wasn't going to go quite so high at first, but all right, I'll bet the same. And now what do we do? <laughs> Just put up the money and let Eddie here handle the rest. You mean we don't have to pick a horse or anything? I thought that was the way... Well, that, that is the way it's done at an ordinary bookmaker's. But this is different. All right. Here's my 40 And mine. How about it, Eddie? They about ready to go? About. I'm getting them on the phone. Now, you see, Fowler, he talks to them direct at the track in New York, and from there he finds out what horse is fixed to win. Then he puts our money on that horse, and it's all set. We win and pocket our money. Mm, I didn't know all the horse races were big. Well, they're not always. But you see, they're putting a bill through the legislature in New York that'll make horse racing illegal. So the men behind it decided to fix the rest of the races in order that they could make sure bets, get their money back before the bill went through. Mm. We just happened to be a couple of the lucky ones on the inside. Yeah, that's pretty smart, all right. Yeah, I can see how it would work. Huh? What's that? Playboy in the fifth. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Check with you a little later. So long. You got it? All set. They're putting the money up now. Race starts in about a minute. You know, I'm... I'm really excited over all this. Yeah, that's all right, Fowler. This being your first time, you would be. But you won't be after you see the way it works. I guess that's a track. Excuse me a minute. Huh? Yeah? Okay, I'll stay on the phone. They've started the race. I'll know the answer in a minute now. <laughs> As if you didn't know the answer already. <laughs> it is a great one for joking, Fowler. I hope he gets the right answer from that thing. I still can't believe that making money is this easy. Don't worry. Oh, I, I'm not worrying, really. It, it's just that, uh... Oh, well... Uh... Hello? Yeah? Playboy it is. Okay. Thanks. I'll call you back in time for the next song. Well, gents, there you are. 
Eighty dollars to you, Mr. Reed, and eighty more to Mr. Fowler. Gosh, you really mean that this is all mine? I want it just like that? Sure, what'd I tell you? It's a fence. Oh, say, can we play some more? I, I mean, I, I don't want to seem greedy, but, well, I, I thought if we could, I, I might try it again. Sure, we can. This is only small stuff anyway. Just as soon as I can get some securities I own turned into cash, I'm going to make a killing. And these other gentlemen don't care? Uh, I mean, they don't mind our taking the money? Of course not. They're getting theirs. That's all that matters to them. Here's the 80 back, Eddie. Uh, play up the next, will you? Sure enough. And here's mine. I want to play all 80 of it, too. That's the spirit, Mr. Fowler. You'll be in a big money pretty soon. That is, if things don't close down before you can raise the dough. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, you see, there's only a little time left for us to operate. If you had a good lump of money to play now, you could really make something. I see. I'll have mine tomorrow, and then it's easy straight for me. Uh, uh, Mr. Reed, uh, that is to say, if I was to raise a good bit of cash by tomorrow or the next day, uh, do you suppose I could place it here? Uh, sure, why not? Or better still, if you have the money in a bank somewhere, it'll take time to get it out. But why not write a check? Would that be all right? I don't see why not. How about it, Eddie? You'll accept Mr. Fowler's check, won't you? Sure. Well, I tell you what. I'd kind of like to sleep on the idea. Suppose I let you know tomorrow, huh? Is that all right with you? Certainly. Then maybe we can get up a pool and make a lot more. I'll have about 3500 tomorrow. How about you, Eddie? You want to make a pool? If Mr. Fowler here decides to go in on it, I might. Well, well uh, I'll think about it, and we can talk it over tomorrow. Fine. There's a track again. Yeah? Okay. Yeah? 80 on it twice. That's right. Yeah, so long. And that fixes that. How do you feel, Mr. Fowler? I, I don't know, I, I guess. I mean... Too good to be true. I must be dreaming. But the bewildered Fowler is not dreaming. And when he leaves the little room that evening, he has more than three hundred dollars in his pocket. Two hundred and sixty more than his original bet. That night he finds sleep impossible. Strange dreams absorb his mind. Dreams of sudden wealth beyond his wildest imagining. A panorama of fleeting thoughts loom in his sleepless brain. Five thousand dollars brings ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars brings twenty thousand. And as sleep at last overpowers him, his decision is made. Early the next morning at breakfast, he finds his friend Harold Reed waiting for him. Surprised, he learns that Reed has moved to the same hotel to be closer, as he puts it, to his only friend. And after a large platter of bacon and eggs, the two men set off for the little room in Venice, there to make their fortune. We find them a little later, talking with Eddie. You're not making any mistake, I can tell you that. Well, figure it out for yourself. I did. All night. Well, and you don't have to be told, I guess. You're smart enough to see a gold mine when it's in front of you. Well, how about this pool idea, Eddie? Mr. Fowler here says he's on. How about you? Sure thing. Well, how much money are you going to put up? Every dime I got. $1,500. Good enough. I got mine here. That is, I got a check for $3,500. I've been wondering. You see, gentlemen, it occurred to me that to sort of save time and all that, I might bet my limit the first time. Uh, that is, of course, if it's all right with you. Sure. With me, anyway. Me, too. How much did you figure on? Well, say about 5000 5000 eh? Well, I don't see anything to stop you. Should we pull it? Fine. Good. Suppose while you make out your check, Mr. Fowler, I contact the tracks and see what we can hit on. Uh, you'll uh, find a pen right over there on that table if you need one. Thanks. I'll get on the phone. Hello, uh, Belmont Park? This is Eddie in Venice, California. Yeah. Uh, what's on the boards for the next race? Yeah. Okay. Swell. Put ten grand on the nose. That's right. On the nose. Okay, Bill. I'll stand by. So long. Uh, here's my check. I think you'll find it all in proper shape. Here's mine, Eddie. Fair enough. We'll be hearing from the boys out the track any time now. And then, well... I know what I'm going to do with my dough. Yeah, how about you, Father? 
Are you going to go back to the farm and settle down? Well, of course I had thought of that. But somehow, well, there's a lot of places that I've never been to. This might be a good time to go travel. That's the spirit. Easy come, easy go. That's the way I feel about it. Uh-uh. That's it. Eddie speaking. Yeah? By a length, eh? Good enough. Did they, uh, is it? I, I mean, did we win? Sure, just like I said. It was a cinch. Ten thousand dollars. And just for doing nothing. Yep. This is the way to make the money, Mr. Fowler. Of course, we'll have to check back on this draft of yours to see that it's right. And then it's ten grand for you. There's no doubt about the check being good, is there, Fowler? Oh, no. And of course not, huh? No, no, of course not. Good enough. I'll take it in and have the boys contact the bank in Illinois. As soon as we get an okay, you're all set. Hey, Fowler. It looks to me like we got something to celebrate about. Let's have a drink. And at about the same time as the gullible Mr. Fowler is mortgaging his farm to play the pony, Lieutenant Edward C. King of the Los Angeles Detective Force receives an urgent call from Chief Sebastian. In the chief's office, they are greeted by Ed Earl, owner of a local newspaper, Frank R. Baker, special prosecutor, and a group of Los Angeles businessmen. Ed, I've been telling these gentlemen about you. I've told them that of all the men I know, you are the one to do the job we have to do. You know most of these gentlemen, I imagine. Mr. Earl, Mr. Baker. I think I know all of them, Chief. Good. <clears throat> now, here's the idea. This department has been under criticism for a long time about our failure to wipe out the bunco artists operating here in Los Angeles. We've been on the fire. It's getting too hot. It's got to stop. Yes, sir. And you're the man that's going to do the stopping. Well, that's fine with me, Chief. But how? By taking the men you want, men you know, and can depend on, and busting up every place about which you have the slightest suspicion. And uh, before you say what I know you're about to say, let me tell you this. We've got the one thing we've needed for a long time. A group of citizens who stand behind us who won't let politics interfere with justice, and a prosecutor who'll bring in a conviction every time we can get the proof. In that case, sir, I'm ready to start any time. I knew that would be your answer. Well, gentlemen, are you satisfied? If they can bring them in, I'll be satisfied. And I'll send them up. I can promise you that. All right, then. It's all your thing. It's directly on your shoulders from now on. You'll be relieved from any other duty. Thank you, sir. Thank me when you bring him in. Realizing that his new assignment is no easy one, Lieutenant King picks his men carefully. While his squad places every dive in the city under surveillance, King settles down to the routine job of checking mug pictures, trying to run down the names of the big shots behind the ring. And just three days later... Lieutenant King, Bunker Detail. This is Robin, Lieutenant. I've got something. Good. What is it? I've been covering a spot in Venice, a little pool hall in Saloon. I heard a couple of men talking this afternoon about a fellow named Fowler that was being taken for all he had. Excellent, Robin. What else? Well, I didn't hear much, but I think the gang has a joint around here somewhere. One of those fake booking places. Now, listen. You stick right there and see if you can get any more dope. Make friends with the men you overheard if you can. Pretend to have lots of money. Anything. Yes, sir. Don't muff, Robin. This is the first lead I've had yet. Yes, sir. Fowler, eh? Fowler. Hmm. That's not too common a name. Reasoning that the bunco victim probably has money and is a stranger, Detective King sends his squad searching through downtown hotels. Two fruitless days pass. And then in a the hotel on this street, Lieutenant King, his partner, Lieutenant Potley, locates their man. The clerk of the desk points Fowler out as he steps from the lobby into the street. The officers follow him. For an hour, they doggedly shadow their man through downtown streets. Well, this is the doggondest chase we've ever gone on. He's walked halfway across town, and now here we are practically back where we started. If he goes back to that hotel and we've done all this hiking for nothing, well, I'll just... Relax. Huh? All right. Hey, wait a minute. He's going in that bank. Now, what the devil? No, no, no. He's stopping in the doorway. Come on. This door interested. Yeah. 
Looks like he's waiting for someone. That's it. Maybe we're in luck after all. He's looking at his watch. Jim, look. That fellow going toward him. I'll bet my last dime that he's the one Fowler's waiting for. Uh, you're right, Ed. They're talking to each other. Come on. We're going to pick him up. All right. Who do you think I am? Well, you can't tell. Oh, pardon me. But isn't your name Fowler? Uh, Benjamin yeah. Fowler? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, we want to talk to you and your friend. Hey, what is this? Stick your hands out, you. Who, me? Yes, you and me. Hey, what are you doing with all that? There. That'll hold you for a while. Now, Mr. Fowler, I wouldn't advise you to try a run out. Because my partner and I have a habit of shooting people who try to get away. Understand? Yes, sir. Say what is all this. What's the idea of these cops? What's your name? What's that to you? All right. Never mind the formalities. I imagine you'll tell us when you spend a little time in jail. You fellas usually do. Now, look here. I don't know what this man has done, but I can assure you that I had nothing whatever to do with it. David, Mr. Fowler, you answer our questions at headquarters, you've got nothing to worry about. Which is more than I can say for your friend here. <laughs> Now, oh, Mr. Fowler, suppose we begin at the beginning. What's your friend's name? Well, I don't know that I should tell you if he now, doesn't Fowler, know. You might as well know right now as later. You're just a sucker. And you're being taken by this guy here, or whatever his name is. How much money have you lost? Why, I, I haven't really lost any money. That is, I, I was going to get it back. Oh, of course. You still don't know what you're up against, eh, Fowler? Well, I'll tell you. I don't know if it's too late for you. But this gentleman sitting here who refuses to give his name happens to be a member of a gang of bunco artists. Do you know what bunco artists are? Well, I don't exactly, but I... I can tell you very quickly. They operate on people like you. People with money who haven't any better sense than to believe their wild stories of get-rich-quick schemes. I... I guess I knew all the time it was too good to be true. Sure. Now, what's this fellow's name? Reed. Harold Reed. That's your right name? Sure it is, officer. But you got me dead wrong. I haven't got anything to do with any gang. No? No. Now, look. Suppose you and I step into the next room for a minute. I'll tell you all about it. All right. Keep Mr. Fowler company, will you, Holly? Uh, sure. Sit down, but we'll be all back right. in a minute. Come along, Mr. Reed. In here. Now, how about it? Now, look here. You look like a good fellow to me. The sort of a man that sees things in the right light. Suppose we talk business. For instance? Well, here. Here's $1,800 in nice, cool, green notes. Take that. Tell the boys you made a mistake and let me out of here. How about it? You wouldn't be offering to bribe me, would you? Now, what do you think? I think I've had enough of this fooling around. I suppose you just elevate your hands and let me look you over. You're making a mistake. I'll have you broken for this. Well, I'll take the chance. Let's see what you've got. Hmm. Telegrams. These should prove interesting. And a wallet. That all? All right. You can put your hands down. Come on. You won't get very far with this. The boys will get me out of here before morning. Sure, I know. All right. Sit down over there and behave yourself. Now, let's see. If I'm not mistaken, these wires refer to you, Mr. Fowler. Not very complimentary, either. Let's see who they're from. Burns. Burns? Holly, I've got it. You remember Blackie Burns? Yeah, we never could pin anything on him. Right, but I think these telegrams will make a difference in all that. In fact, if I'm not very far wrong, all we have to do is find Mr. Burns, and we'll have the man behind this whole gang. <laughs> days in jail and Reed finally breaks, admits to the name of Rial, and tells the whole story. Fowler, when faced with a cold fact, confesses to King that he has spent his last cent on bet, that his entire bankroll, including the mortgage in his farm, has disappeared, that he had been urged to bet his winnings after collecting his $10,000 and that he had lost them. And King, leaving him a broken man, built of every dime he owned, starts out after the elusive leader of the gang, Blackie Burns. After checking on Burns' movements over the past few years, King learns that he owns the largest estate in the San Fernando Valley. King and a handful of men search the place thoroughly, but find no sign of Burns himself. Months go by, and Burns does not appear. King receives a tip that Burns has been seen back on the ranch. 
But he has driven one of his ranch hands off the place, threatening to kill him with a shotgun. Enlisting the cooperation of Detective William Ingram, Lieutenant King starts for the ranch early the next morning. At dawn, the two men stake out of the high brush a hundred yards from the front door of the ranch house and settle down to wait for some sign of her. This may be another wild goose chase, Bill, but I'm going to sit here if it takes a month. I want this Burns fellow. So I gathered. You've wanted him for a long time. Yeah, but this time we've got all we need on him. Hey, yeah, look over there. Someone's coming out the door. Yeah, a woman. Uh, Mrs. Burns. Hmm. She's given the landscape a thorough once over. Well, he suppose it's up. Maybe Burns is going to try a break. Hey, hey Ed, look. Yeah, I see. Burns, all right. He's kissing her goodbye. Are we rushing? No. Let him get away from the house. And we'll take no chance of his giving us a slip. I don't know where he hides in that house, but I know he was there when we searched it, and we couldn't find hiding or hair of him. Hey, look. He's coming right toward us. Good. Watch yourself now. When he gets close, nab him. Right. I hope he hasn't any of his boys watching him. Right. 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 Hasn't any of his boys watching him. I had many of his boys watching it. 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 He makes twelve targets from that house. You said it. Here he comes. Let's take him now. Stick him up, Burns. Where the devil did you come from? Never mind that. Stick up your hand. Yeah, that's better. Frisk him, Bill. Right. This is one on me, I guess. I didn't figure you were anywhere around here, King. Oh, you know me. Sure. I know you all right. Matter of fact, I was so close to you when you were searching the house once that I could have touched you. Yeah, I knew you were in there all right. But I'll have to admit I didn't know just where. Would you mind telling me now that it's all over? Not at all. You know the big fireplace in the front room? The one you kept crawling in? Yeah. And there's a little panel that slides in the wall there. And every time you stuck your big fat head in that fireplace, I could have opened it and sunk a piece of lead pipe into your skull. It was an awful temptation. <laughs> Burns and Rial, his assistant, were tried in the Los Angeles Superior Court and found guilty of fraud, violating the horse racing laws, and were sentenced to San Quentin. The first two men to be sent to the penitentiary by the Bunco Detail, and Fowler, the victim, returned to his form in Illinois, a sadder but wiser man. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, the Junior Police Department of the Rio Grande Oil Company now has nearly 100,000 members among the boys and girls of California, Arizona, and Nevada. These boys and girls have junior police badges, guns with Sam Brown uniform belt and pistol holster, scientific fingerprint outfits, detective microscopes, and many other items of G-Man and detective equipment. All these articles are free given away by the Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline Dealer in your neighborhood. Ask him to enroll you in Rio Grande's Junior Police Department so you can get all these free gifts. If there is a new car in your family, you should know that motor oil and lubrication requirements have changed radically in the last few years. Rio Grande has trained its independent service station operators in the exact and correct uses of thin clear oils and greases according to the infallible Sinclair Law of Lubrication. Take your car to your Rio Grande station and look over the Sinclair service manual, which gives last-minute instructions, flashed direct from the factory, covering every part of every car. Sinclair has grown into one of the world's largest manufacturers of lubricants, and your Rio Grande cracked gasoline dealer is equipped to provide Sinclair's complete scientific lubrication service for your car. It costs no more to get Sinclair scientific lubrication. A 
Assembly of Police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 128. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Rolls and burns. available wherever Rio Grande cracks gasoline is sold. Ask for your free copy. 